last time, the relationship between IR theory and actual IR practice. And, you know, we were also discussing the various weaknesses and strengths of our two theories, realism and liberalism. And I guess I want to start off the topic, that I guess I want to start off the discussion today by asking really the most poignant question that we've reached so far. How effective do realist and liberal theories really work today in Iowa? You know, can you be one or the other? Does one answer all the questions that the other one cannot? Um, or are you of the mind that you feel the best way of understanding how the world works today is to really kind of work within a hybrid, a mishmash of both. I mean, can you point to, let's just say, US foreign policy, for instance, and point out, oh, that's realism right there, that's realism right there, that over there, that's a little bit more of liberalism. I mean, is it normal, is it natural for a state to operate within two theoretical fields? Sometimes, is it normal, is it somehow rational for a state to do both at the same time. The follow-up question to all of that is, how secure has the world really become today? You know, with all of the understandings of liberalism through institutions, through transnational cooperation and interaction, um, are we any safer now than we were in 1914, when liberalism looks at the world and says, that could have been avoided if we had better institutions, right? That could have been avoided if Germany just, oh, I don't know, was a little bit more honest with its neighbors, okay? I mean, have we reached better security in the world today? Are we just as vulnerable? Are we more vulnerable in the world today than we were 100 years ago, okay? Or are we just using a whole bunch of, as I say, big words to make us look more sophisticated? Right? If you really feel that not much has changed since 1914, just the threats and the targets, well, you know, and in that case, I wouldn't necessarily call you a realist, but I would definitely say that you are not as optimistic as many of the liberalists would have you believe. So let's then take a look then at our third case study, what I like to call Syria, total war. And, you know, if you've been paying attention to the news over the past week, two weeks or so, you would know that the game has noticeably changed in favor of the Assad regime. Although many analysts would say that Bashar al-Assad's leadership, his, you know, the regime government, the government forces in Syria, kind of always had a tactical advantage for a number of reasons. But as you all know, what was the major game changer that's, uh, that's been taking place in Syria over the past week, two weeks or so? Russia's intervention. Like Russia has all but gotten itself you know, fully and officially involved. Um, not only have they been giving uh, material and, mil and economic material, military support to the Syrian government, there are now what we would call the proverbial boots on the ground. Um, just this morning, um, I read a report that Russia <coughs> has launched missiles against enemy uh, targets from as far away as the Caspian Sea, uh, which is kind of like somewhere where the uh, projector thing comes down, okay? Um, here's the other thing. Russia is openly supporting the Assad regime in formal alliance with Iran, as well as Iraq, okay? So over the past two weeks or so, there's now been four states, Moscow, Damascus, Tehran, and Baghdad. Russia, Syria, Iran, and Iraq. They are now coordinating their communication, coordinating their forces into propping up the Assad regime. If you look at the color of the map here, and you know, this is not accurate because the battle lines change every single day. But this is about as recent as one can get. The areas in red, which are pretty much in Syria's western regions, are those that are held by the Assad regime. Those in green are sort of collectively regarded as the you know, hodgepodge group of anti-Assad forces that range from the so-called Syrian moderates that the United States loves to refer to them as, and I deliberately use the word moderates in quotes, to um, the al-Nusra front, which is kind of like a little offshoot of al-Qaeda. Um, the yellow is Team Kurdistan, which has their own battles, has their own agendas, has their own interests. Um, they are neither for nor against the Assad regime, but their goals are, at the absolute least, 
to secure greater autonomy for the Kurdish regions. And then the stuff in gray and black, well, that's just Cobra. I'm sorry, I mean ISIS. Okay? And, you know, ISIS, which controls large swaths of territory in Syria's north and central regions. Okay? Now, looking at the situation in Syria and reading all of the news that comes through the, you know, through the news feeds, okay? The United States is not particularly happy with Russia's involvement for a number of reasons. Chief of which is that Russia is being accused by the United States of getting itself involved in a country's fate where it has no business in getting itself involved. And I know it's coming from the United States. It's kind of hilarious, okay? But in all fairness, in all fairness, Russia is being um, chided. Now, again, you have to take all of these things with a certain grain of salt. You really don't know how true these statements are. And I trust statements coming from Moscow as much and as little as I trust statements coming from Washington these days. That the only people that you can totally take their word for is Team Kurdistan. That's about it. Okay? But the United States is basically saying that Russia's involvement is exacerbating the conflict, not ameliorating it. On the rationale that Russia is striking both the green regions, the areas of the anti-Assad rebel forces, with just as much, if not more, vigor as they are attacking ISIS. Russia responds by saying it doesn't really matter whether it's ISIS or the al-Nusra Front or the so-called Free Syrian Army, okay? All of these forces have one thing in common. They are anti-Assad. They are against the sovereign and legitimate government of Syria which right now is still Bashar al-Assad. The United States responds, and it plays the liberal card. The United States is for the most part playing the liberal card here by justifying support for the so-called Free Syrian Army and various revolutionaries because of the understanding that they embody some principle of democracy. Now, whether or not that's true, again, take it with a grain of salt, because we've heard this story before. We've heard it with Iraq, we've heard it with Libya. And Russia responds by saying, look, America, I hate to point out the painfully obvious, but every time you like to play regime change, whatever democratic opposition you're throwing Tootsie Rolls at doesn't create democracy when it comes to power. If anything, it makes the situation even worse. We've seen what happened with Iraq, but even worse, we see what happened with Libya. The fact that we actually have to say, the fact that we could say with some confidence that life in Libya was actually better under Gaddafi than it was now is not a happy statement to make. But the idea here is Assad has the support of a number of elements within Syria, the chief of which are the Shia, Alawite, and Druze communities of Muslims. Equally important, Assad has almost the entire support of Syria's Christian community, which up until 2011 was relatively safe and relatively secure in Syria in comparison to most other countries in the Middle East. Especially after the insurgency in Iraq, Syria's Christian community actually increases in size from a number of Iraqi Christians that run across the border and actually say life is safe and secure in Syria. Problem here is that if Assad falls, the Alawites, the Druze, and the Christians realize the game is up. There's no support that they're going to get. There is absolutely zero support from ISIS, which has proven time and time again that ISIS does one thing and one thing really good, kill anything in its path. And even when there's nobody in its path, blow a whole bunch of stuff up because, well, we've got ordinance that we need to get rid of. The Free Syrian Army, that's a crapshoot. We really don't know what they're going to do if they ever achieve power. And so the rationale is better to deal with the devil you know than the devil you don't. Now, that really is the realist standpoint. The realist standpoint is what's played by Russia, which is I'm backing up the Syrian army I'm backing up the Syrian government for a number of reasons. One, I'm propping up stability. Two, I'm against regime change. <coughs> Let's also throw in the third thing. Realism, if anything, is also about national interest. Does Russia have its own personal interest in Syria? 
Absolutely. Russia has at least two critical things in Syria. Number one, if you know over here, right here on the eastern edge of the Mediterranean, there's two ports, Tarsus and Latakia. Both of them are open to Russian naval bases. That is Russia's only Mediterranean access. So as far as they're concerned, it is in their interest to prop up the Assad regime. Does Russia really care about the fate of Alawite, Alawites, Druze, Shia, and Christians? If they do, it's secondary to their own strategic interests. Play it the other way around. Can the United States be a realist in all of this? Sure. Does the United States have vested interest in overthrowing Assad? Absolutely. Do they have vested interest in installing a more pro-American, pro-Western government in Damascus? Sure, in theory. Do they actually have it? We don't know. Okay, we don't know. Thing to take away from what's going on in Syria today is that it is difficult, if not outright impossible, to look at it through the lens of any one theoretical prison. Because even if you play the American card of or is trying to give these people freedom and democracy, it's going to be a very pirate victory. A very, very pirate victory if that happens. The fact that half of Syria's population is now somewhere on the road between Istanbul and Munich gives you enough evidence to suggest that the idea of democratic peace theory may only be a cover for greater interests.